So I'm going to read the uh, first section of uh, the discovery of evolution, the perception of space-time, from uh, Teilhard de Chardin's book, The Phenomena of Man, which actually, that's a bad translation. It's the human phenomenon in French. Um, but uh, I see what you think of this. We have all forgotten the moment when, opening our eyes for the first time, we saw light and things around us all jumbled up and all on one single plane. It requires a great effort to imagine the time when we were unable to read, or again to take our minds back to the time when for us the world extended no farther than the walls of our home and our family circle. Similarly, it seems to us incredible that men could have lived without suspecting that the stars are hung above us hundreds of light years away or that the contours of life stretched out millions of years behind us to the limits of our horizon. Yet we have only to open any of those books with barely yellowing pages in which the authors of the 16th or even as late as the 18th century discoursed on the structure of worlds to be startled by the fact that our great-great-great-grandfathers felt perfectly at ease in a cubic space where the stars turned round the earth and had been doing so for less than 6,000 years. In a cosmic atmosphere which would suffocate us from the first moment, and in perspectives in which it is physically impossible for us to enter, they breathe without any inconvenience, if not very deeply. Between them and us, what then has happened? I know of no more moving story, nor any more revealing of the biological reality of new genesis, than that of intelligence struggling step by step from the beginning to overcome the encircling illusion of proximity. In the course of this struggle to master the dimensions and the relief of the universe, space was the first to yield, naturally, because it was more tangible. In fact, the first hurdle was taken in this field when long, long ago a man, some Greek no doubt, before Aristotle, bending back a on itself the apparent flatness of things, had an intuition that there were antipodes. From then onwards, round the round earth, the firmament itself rolled roundly, but the focus of the spheres was badly placed. By its situation, it incurably paralyzed, by its situation, it incurably paralyzed the elasticity of the system. It was only really in the time of Galileo through rupture with the ancient geocentric view, that the skies were made free from the boundless expansions which we have since detected in them. The earth became a mere speck of sidereal dust. Immensity became possible, and to balance it, the infinitesimal sprang into existence. For lack of apparent yardsticks, the depths of the past took much longer to be plumbed. The movement of stars, the shape of mountains, the chemical nature of bodies, Indeed, all matter seemed to express a continual present. The physics of the 17th century was incapable of opening Pascal's eyes to the abysses of the past. To discover the real age of the earth, and then of the elements, it was necessary for man to become fortuitously interested in an object of moderate mobility, such as life, for instance, or even volcanoes. It was thus through a narrow crack, that of natural history, then in its infancy, that from the 18th century onwards, light began to seep down into the great depths beneath our feet. In these initial estimates, the time considered necessary for the formation of the world was still very modest, but at least the impetus had been given and the way out opened up. After the walls of space, shaken by the Renaissance, it was the floor and consequently the ceiling of time which, from Buffon onwards, became mobile. Since then, under the unceasing pressure of facts, the process has continually accelerated. Although the strain has been taken off for close on 200 years, the spirals of the world have still not been relaxed. The distance between the turns and the spiral has seemed ever greater, and there have always been further turns appearing deeper still. Yet in these first stages of man's awakening to the immensities of the cosmos, space, and time, however vast, still remained homogeneous and independent of each other. They were two great containers, quite separate from one another, extending infinitely, no doubt, but in which things floated about or were packed together in ways.
is owing nothing to the nature of their setting. The two compartments have been enlarged beyond measure, but within each of them the objects seemed as freely transposable as before. It seemed as if they could be placed here or there, moved forward, pushed back, or even suppressed at will. If no one ventured formally as far as this play of thought, at least there was still no clear idea why or to what extent it was impossible. This was a question which did not arise. It was only in the middle of the 19th century, again under the influence of biology, that the light dawned at last, revealing the irreversible coherence of all that exists. From the concatenations of life, and soon after those of matter. First the concatenations of life, and soon after those of matter. The least molecule is, in nature and in position, a function of the whole sidereal process, and the least of the protozoa is structurally so knit into the web of life that its existence cannot be hypothetically annihilated without ipso facto undoing the whole network of the biosphere. The distribution, succession, and solidarity of objects are born from their concrescence in a common genesis. Time and space are organically joined again so as to weave together the stuff of the universe. That is the point we have reached and how we perceive things today. It's the first time I'm reading this, by the way, so I'm a little excited by that, actually. Psychologically, what is hidden behind this initiation? That was a question. <laughs> Psychologically, what is hidden behind this initiation? One might well become impatient or lose heart at the sight of so many minds, and not mediocre ones either, remaining today still closed to the idea of evolution. If the whole of history were not there to pledge to us that a truth once seen, even by a single mind, always ends up by imposing itself on the totality of human consciousness? For many, evolution is still only transformism, and transformism is only an old Darwinian hypothesis as local and as dated as Laplace's conception of the solar system, or Wegener's theory of continental drift. And that is, blind indeed are those who do not see the sweep of a movement whose orbit in infinitely transcends the natural sciences and has successively invaded and conquered the surrounding territory, chemistry, physics, sociology, and even mathematics, and the history of religions. One after the other, all the fields of human knowledge have been shaken and carried away by the same underwater current in the direction of the study of some development. Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must, must bow in which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines must follow. In the last century and a half, the most prodigious event, perhaps, ever recorded by her history since the threshold of reflection has been taking place in our minds, the definitive access of consciousness to a scale of new dimensions, and in consequence the birth of an entirely renewed universe, without any change of line or feature by the simple transformation of its intimate substance. Until that time, the world seemed to rest, static and fragmentable, on the three axes of its geometry. Now it is casting from a single mold. What makes and classifies a, a modern man and a whole host of our contemporaries is not yet modern in this sense, is having become capable of seeing in terms not of space and time alone, but also of duration or, it comes to the same thing, of biological space-time, and above all, having become incapable of seeing anything otherwise, anything, not even himself. This last step brings us to the heart of the metamorphosis, which I'm not going to read right now, maybe later, but uh, if you're excited, you should read the rest of this book. It's awesome. So far, I'm only up to there. <laughs>